Good morning. Good morning. Clark, welcome home. Glad you're here, man. Glad you all are here. Welcome to those of you who are here in person, those of you who are joining us for worship from home as well. So glad that you can uh, be with us today. Pray together the prayer of the day. 
O God, almighty and humble, grant us divine wisdom and grace to lay aside all envy and selfish ambition, that we may welcome and honor those who are most vulnerable and least regarded, following the way of your beloved, Jesus Christ, our rescuer and ruler. Amen. And now we invite the children who are here present to come forward, and those of you watching from home, uh, bring the kids close. I've got my buddy with me today. Hi, how are you? I'm Ray, by the way. Raven. Yeah, yeah. Hi, guys. How are you? Oh, who's that? Hello. Who is that? Who's that? You have someone too. What, what's his name? Or her? Pow Pow Fish. Pow Pow Fish. Woo! Pow Pow Fish. So, what I do here? What's, who's this? Oh, you are cute. You guys are cute too. Ah. So, how about you? You don't have anyone. I have you. Oh, yeah, you have me. Hi, everybody. Hello, people from home. Glad you're here, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what are we talking about today? Well, I wanted to ask you, okay, how do you know if someone is wise? Oh, oh, I know that answer. That's easy. Easy. Okay, so what's the answer? You are wise if you are a raven. Yep, 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 yep. Or a crow or a magpie. They are very smart. Did you know that? Oh, well, see, you're smart too. He's smart too. Ravens and magpies and crows are really smart. Not only do we use tools, we can make tools. Did you know that? I don't know if they knew that. Yeah, that's how you know if you're wise. Answer done. Let's move on. Well, um, actually, there might be more to it than that. Really? Yeah. Um, I mean, that's smart. You bet it's smart. Exactly, but smart and wise may not always be the same thing. Really? Yeah. Um, so what are some other ways? What do you think? How can you tell if somebody is wise? What do you think? Everybody thinks owls are wise, but they just keep asking the same question. Who? Who? That's not wise. Um, how, about, how about if people get really good grades in school? That would be wise, right? Yeah, yeah. That, that, that's a good answer. Well, again, that's, that's smart, um, but smart and wise may not always be the same. Okay, you clearly have an answer you want. Tell us. Okay. In one of the stories that we hear today about a guy named James, he was writing to his friends in the church, and he was trying to help them know how to tell what wisdom is. And what did James say? By the way, was he a raven? We uh, do not think he was a raven. Oh. Well, I'll listen to him anyway. He said, you can tell someone is wise when they speak and act with kindness. What? Kindness? Kindness is wise? Exactly. We think that being smart is all that you need to be wise. But James said, when we follow Jesus, wisdom looks like kindness. That's what God thinks of as kindness. Ah. So, to be wise, be kind. Ah, so don't be a wise guy, be a kind guy. Amen. Thanks, guys. Thanks for bringing your friends, too. The Holy Gospel according to Mark, the ninth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus and the disciples went on and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying, and were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way, they had argued with one another who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them, and taking it in his arms, he said to them, 
Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes not only me, but the one who sent me. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Raise your hand if you know how to play hide and seek. Oh, almost all the hands are going up. Can't look to see if your hands are going up too. Um, yeah, so a, a pretty simple game. Uh, everybody hides except for one person. That person goes and tries to find, and if, uh, if I'm the one, and I find Yvonne where she's hiding, then she joins me and we go together and we try to find Paula, and then we all go, once we find Paula, and we, then we find Becky, and so we found everybody, right? And, uh, and hopefully you're not so good at hiding that people just give up and, and they leave and, and you're stuck there, right? Raise your hand if you have played sardines. Ah, some of you have played sardines, exactly. And some of you don't know what sardines is, probably. Take hide and seek and flip it. So instead of having one person seeking while everybody uh, else is hiding, you have one person hiding and everybody seeking. But if, let's say, Karen is the one who's hiding, and we're all looking and I'm the one who finds her first, I don't call out and say, hey everybody, I found Karen. Instead, what I do is, wake up these garden vehicles in trouble and those rest and protect. I say that with the siren gone by. Uh, when I find Karen, I'm very quiet and I join her wherever she's hiding, hence sardines, because the more of us get together, the more we're stuck together. So you flip it. You, you flip the intention of the game and kind of do it the opposite. Sometimes you can have, um, two different strategies by two different players in the exact same game. Our family, when we get together, we like to play the game, the card game of hearts. And in hearts, generally what you want to do is avoid points. You don't want to get any points, so you, you don't want to win a trick, win a hand that's got points in it. And the way we do it in our family is uh, we don't like to get stuck with the hand that we're dealt with, so we, we usually trade cards. So you know, I'll trade cards to the person three to the person to my left, and then the person to my right will give me three, etc. So then you have to strategize as you're working on it. How can I get rid of the, the highest powerful cards and give them to her so she's got them? Meanwhile, he's given the same to me, so you gotta watch out for that. But you gotta strategize so that you're not going to take uh, very many hands, unless, unless you think you can win every single point. And if you win every single point, then you have the choice to either take points off of your score or add them on to somebody else. So then your strategy flips again. You're looking at the cards in your hand, you're like, I'm not gonna get rid of my strong cards, I'm gonna get rid of my weak cards. I hope somebody else gives me more strong cards. Again, you just totally flip the script, change the strategy entirely. And I find it intriguing um, as we, we hear the story about Jesus that he asks them what they were talking about on the way, and he knows darn well what they were talking about on the way, right? He knows that they were arguing about who was going to be the greatest among them, even though they don't even really understand what it is they're doing. But he, what's amazing to me is he does not scold them. He does not say, you shouldn't even be trying to be the best. Don't do that. That's, that's wrong. He obviously wasn't from the Midwest, where you know, I grew up and was like, don't think more of yourself than you are. I have a friend who says, uh, her dad used to, to tell her, you, you, you think you're such a big deal? Go stick your finger in the lake and pull it out and see what a difference you make when you pull your finger out. He doesn't scold them. He doesn't say you should not want to be great in the kingdom of God. Instead, he says, let me tell you the strategy. Now, that you would think the strategy would be one thing, to be smarter than, to be cleverer than, to be more powerful than, to be all those things that the world teaches us about how to get ahead. Have a bigger church with more people and more money. Do all these things that make you look, uh, you know, get a book published, uh, uh, get a podcast, do all these things that make you cooler and more successful than other people. The world tells us that's how we judge success. And Jesus said, no, go for success. All for it, you betcha. Just need a new strategy. If you want to get ahead in the kingdom of God, you can do it, but the strategy looks different. You want to be first? Be last. You want to be a leader? Be a servant. 
which, I mean, we can kind of hear him go, yeah, yeah, sure, Jesus is all about serving God. Sure, got it, now let's move on to the next thing. But it's hard to do. It's one thing to think it. It's one thing to understand it sort of as a concept. It's another thing to live it out. What does it look like when you live that out? Well, I think of, for one person, to think of Jim, uh, who is part of the congregation that I interned at in Dallas. And he was a, he was a, a successful businessman, and he was uh, doing great until there was a cutback at his company, and he lost his job. Went from being an executive one week to being unemployed the next. And it hit him hard, not just you know, economically, but in terms of his identity. That was who he was, was a successful businessman, and now that was taken away. Who, who was he? And it was really hard. But my uh, internship supervisor pastor was, was really wise. And he advised him to, to do three things. He said, you know, go see a counselor who can help you work through that. And you know, start doing some exercising. You know, get, get physical and, and get out there. And he said, third, you've got all this spare time while you're, you're looking for a new job. But rather than just sitting around worrying about it, use that, that spare time and find a nonprofit that you care about and volunteer. You to give your time and your energy and your passion there. Show up and clock in and then clock out at the end of the day so that you have a purpose, so that you have something that, that is drawing you out of yourself. And Jim said that was, the, that was the thing that saved him. It did so many things for him. It gave him an identity again. I am somebody. I am somebody who gives and who serves. And it gave him a purpose. I, I, I have a reason to get up in the morning. I can still make a difference in the world even if I'm not bringing in the big bucks. I still have a purpose. And it, it helped him to see the world differently. To see these people that he was working not just for, but working with. And to make connections and make relationships that were different and broader and deeper than he would have otherwise. By becoming a servant, he actually enhanced and deepened his own life. And came out of that time stronger and better and deeper with a, with a more profound faith than he ever had before. I think of Rodrigo. Rodrigo is a server at Village Smithy in Carbondale, where sometimes we'll go uh, for brunch after a Sunday, uh, after worship on a Sunday. And Rodrigo always has the biggest smile and just such genuine warmth. He's so glad to see you, especially if he recognizes you, if, if you're somewhat of a regular. Even if he's not serving at your table as he's going by, just a big high five. And uh, if, he's, if he can at all make time, even if he's not your servant, he'll come and he'll sit down at our table. And he'll say, so Jeff, what did you preach about today? <laughs> so today, if we go, Isabel, I can tell him, I preached about you, Rodrigo. But sometimes we'll sit and we'll chat and, and we'll say, man, you, we're just so grateful for you because of the spirit that you bring. He says, you know, this is, this is my calling. This is, this is what I'm meant to do. I love feeding people. And I love bringing them uh, just a, a little bit of joy and, and happiness and positivity in their life. This is, this is what I'm called to do. Serving doesn't have to be something that is diminishing, something that that is something that we look down on, that we have to uh, kowtow to. Serving can be who we are. Serving can be a way of living into our best selves. Serving can be a way to say, hey, this is awesome, what I get to do. Not just what I have to do, but what I get to do. I get to bring good things into the world. God says, I want to feed people, I want to I want to comfort people and says, you, how about you? And we say, ah, really? And God says, yeah. And we say, okay. And when we do it, like, hey, you know what? This is something that I can do and it, it can feel good. It can feel like who I am in the world. I think of Susie, Susie Amishaw from, from Good Shepherd, who, who her, her whole working life is about serving because she's a nurse. I mean, that's a lot of serving, right? That's a lot of giving of yourself, especially in these difficult times. 
But beyond that, <laughs> Susie is so wonderful. She has come along with uh, trips with our youth group as, as an adult leader. She's come with us to Mexico and to New Orleans and to um, Houston and been there with us as, as we were serving in those communities. And one of the things that we, we often discover when we do this with, with the youth groups, I, particularly I remember uh, when we went to Mexico, which was some years ago, and there was this new little gadget that had come out recently called an MP3 player. Uh, little, you know, iPods and, and things like that. And so the kids were all about you know, sharing their music on their, their MP3 players on the way as we were getting there to Mexico. And then we put them aside while we were there because we were serving at an orphanage. And we, we had hoped that we would help build something there for them, but they weren't ready for building yet. They were ready for not construction, but deconstruction. And uh, that's right on my alley. I'm not so good at building, but breaking things, I can break things. So uh, we called ourselves the, the rubble rousers because we did a lot of that. Um, but we also spent a lot of time together with the, the orphans who were there. And it was so eye-opening for our kids to realize there was not an MP3 anywhere in that orphanage. But you know what there was a lot of? There was joy. And there was camaraderie. And there was community. And there was relationship. And there was, there was just happiness. You know what they had? They, they had um, a four-square uh, court there on the concrete. And they had a kickball. And they would, they would do uh, four square challenges. And our kids just dove in and they had the best time while they were playing with these kids who supposedly had nothing. They came to serve and discovered things that they would not have noticed otherwise. Joy and depth and relationship. And Susie has been so important to helping that happen. A person who brings her own spirit of service and her own ability to draw out of kids, not just doing it, but reflecting on it, thinking about what did you see, what did you notice, what did you hear, what did you feel, what's different, what's new for you, and most of all, just her ministry of presence. I gotta tell you folks, just showing up makes a huge difference. Showing up with our young people, showing up with folks who are hurting, showing up for those who are vulnerable. It's great when we bring meals, to the folks at the extended table and also just showing up makes a huge difference. And then of course I think of Jesus. Jesus who as we understand him to be is God. I mean is, is the big one, you know? Was there at creation. Is the one through whom all that is came into being. And yet this is the one who says hey I came to earth not to, to lord it over people, not to boss people around. I came not to be served, but to serve. This is the one who is the Lord and the master and the Messiah and the teacher and the guide and the one who knows all the answers. And what does he do on his last night with his friends? He washes their feet. He washes their feet. And he says, this is what it is to be part of me and part of my mission. So, yeah, let's, let's be the best. It's okay. It's okay to want to be the best in the kingdom of God. We just have to make sure that we're following the right strategy. Follow the strategy of service. Amen.
kingdom of God is a worldview of abundance. <laughs> there's plenty, you know. There's plenty of my love. There's plenty of grace. Uh, it's amazing that people can have read the Gospels and still have a worldview of scarcity. And, and you see how the dualistic mind is at work there. Now the new bad people are uh, the Muslims. They've got to have an enemy. You've got to have somebody to hate because there's so much fear and anger inside of you, you it's got to have an outlet. So you will find an outlet. And we, every century of the church, you know, we, we see Jews all being, already being scapegoated in the New Testament. <laughs> we see women shortly thereafter, heretics, witches. <laughs> uh, it's always a new acceptable group. Uh, because that hate energy inside the soul has to find an outlet and a focus. What you got to do is heal it right in here where it's not there so it doesn't need anywhere to go. Uh, but that's called transformative gospel. And a lot of our people haven't gotten there yet. It's usually only a major humiliation that will get them there. They have to fail and fall themselves, or someone they love deeply. Like I've met so many people. Who were these bigoted Christians? And then their son is gay, or their daughter's a lesbian. Finally, the love is close enough to home that they get it. Now some even don't get it that. It's pretty amazing. Why do we gotta die to live? Because, see, what has to die is this little boundary, this little Richard self, in my case. And until that ego boundary collapses, you don't link to what's really life, which is everybody else, too. Uh, so that has to go. It has to go. Now, you've perhaps met children like Down syndrome children and handicapped. See, they lose them. They hardly, no, they don't really build the boundary. Either. Yeah, there's yeah. no commodity. No, no, that's it. They never do it. And that's why they're so close you know, to the mystery, much closer than we are. You know, the, the guy who's the head of Special Olympics just called me a couple nights ago. He's reading my books. And uh, he's gonna write a book on this very subject after working for years. The Special Olympics. He says, Father, just tell me, am I wrong? He said, it appears to me that these people who are handicapped really are ahead of most of us. He said, and the reason Jesus tells us to go to them is not to help them, but so they can help us. And I said, you got it, you got it. Uh, and he said, is that good theology? I said, to such as these, the kingdom of heaven belongs. You just got the gospel. But here's a good Irish, Catholic, PhD, well-educated, and he's read my stuff, and he was pretty sure that was the gospel, but he had to have final reassurance because it's so contrary to most of the Sunday morning sermons he's heard his whole life. Isn't that unbelievable?
September 25 will be Ruthie Parrish's birthday, and uh, I know that uh, Ruthie will at least be watching the, uh, the edited version of this 
uh, once we get that up. So uh, if you all are willing, I would love for us to sing happy birthday to Ruthie. Laura, can you give us a, a note that's... I could find one, but it wouldn't be a right one.